Thank you, Dr. Perlmutter. Um, first of all, happy Mother's Day. Um, I want to congratulate you all on this momentous occasion. Not only are you graduating from this fine medical school, but many of you are doing so as the first class to have been exposed to a new and transformative curriculum, one focused on promoting health equity. Today, Today, I will tell you three stories, stories that reveal the powerful alchemy that emerges when one combines story with science. This theme closely aligns with many of the bullet points from your graduation oath, and I hope that you come away from my speech further inspired to pursue those lofty goals on your journey towards promoting health equity. In 2020, in the wake of George Floyd's murder at the hands of the Minneapolis police, the American Medical Association released a statement recognizing that racism in its systemic, structural, institutional, and interpersonal forms was an urgent threat to public health. And in the spring of 2022, in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic and in the face of data demonstrating the disproportionate toll the virus was taking on communities of color, the CDC declared that racism was a serious public health threat and stated that it would be taking specific action to address the issue. These declarations, long overdue, were notable not only for their pointed clarity, but also for what they did not say. The CDC did not declare that food or housing insecurity, crowded living conditions, poor working conditions, incarceration or mistrust in medicine, all risk factors for COVID, are serious public health threats. Rather, they recognize that communities of color are disproportionately subject to all of these risk factors due to the racism baked into our society. The power of these statements rest in part on the fact that they acknowledge that racism is not just the driver of horrid newsworthy events, but also is a root cause for the ordinary medical events that play out in hospitals, ERs, and clinics across America every day. Amputations among black individuals suffering from type 2 diabetes, deaths from asthma among Hispanic children living in previously redlined areas of our cities, and excess morbidity uh, and mortality from end-stage kidney disease among Native Americans. Now on to my first story. As soon as the COVID epidemic hit, my primary care clinic transitioned from providing patient care via in-person visits to one that largely relied on telephone visits. The purpose of this shift, of course, was less to protect the clinicians and more to prevent viral exposure and spread between our patients, nearly all of whom are poor people of color. They often have several co-occurring chronic diseases that make them especially susceptible to death from COVID. On one of those early months, before the vaccines had been developed, a particularly challenging but endearing patient of mine, a promising young artist in the local rap scene who rarely kept his doctor's appointments, actually showed up in person. Marshawn entered my room with the remnants of a limp as he was still learning to walk without the pivot point of the big toe that he'd recently lost to a type two diabetes-related amputation. Once a disease of the elderly, Type 2 diabetes has now extended into the population of lower income young adults of color. I was surprised to see him as nearly all my other patients were trying to stay away from hospitals if they could. He dropped into the chair in the corner, casually sliding down and stretched out his long legs into the center of the room. He leaned back with a flat bill of his cap sloping over his brow, part of his face shrouded behind beaded dreadlocks, the rest of his face obscured by a poorly donned surgical mask. Out of his earbuds leaked the tinny articulations of a rapper and the staccato sounds of a backbeat. Some would interpret his attitude as disrespectful, but I chose not to take any offense. He had first presented to my hospital with a blood sugar of over 800, nearly in coma. He had never connected with any doctors in follow-up. And apart from that ICU stay, he had not taken insulin since. Ten years later, in the early days of our relationship, I had attended to a bedridden Marchand on a ward of San Francisco General Hospital. As I treated the bone infection in his foot, trying to ward off an amputation, 
I learned that Marshawn had grown up in abject poverty in a largely black neighborhood, that he was forced to subsist on syrup sandwiches and Kool-Aid. As a teenager and young adult, he had witnessed two of his closest friends get shot and killed, so I knew that meeting him where he was at needed to be my M.O. I motioned to pull out his earbuds, and we exchanged pleasantries. I examined his stump while probing him with questions about his blood sugar levels and asking whether he had housing and adequate food. As I was inspecting the state of his post-operative foot, all I could think of was the fact that his poorly controlled diabetes made Marshawn particularly vulnerable to acquiring and dying from COVID-19. Toward the end of our visit, I reviewed the importance of his keeping an eye out for COVID symptoms and about masking and maintaining social distance as keys to prevention. He told me that he got it, but I had learned that getting concrete was the only way to discover whether my patients and I were actually on the same page. So I asked him what his plans were for the rest of the day. He told me that right after our visit, he was going to head out to an enclosed studio session to record a new tune with about 10 other rappers and musicians. I knew how for him, making music was both a source of pride and vitality. But given the state of COVID, I took a deep breath and firmly recommended that he not go to the studio at this time that it was dangerous to be so exposed to others who might have the virus. Yeah, Doc, I appreciate what you're trying to do, what you're saying, but this ain't no big thing for me. What do you mean, Marshawn? It's like everybody's freaking out. Well, I think people are freaking out for good reason. No, I mean it's like people finally got spooked. Like now they suddenly know what fear feels like, and so they're just freaking out. You know what I'm saying? I'm not freaking out about it. I'm trying to stay chill because my life's been like this every day. Every day, Doc. This is just a blip for me. This corona thing ain't nothing compared to what I've been going through every day of my life. So now suddenly people are freaking? I let that rhetorical question sit. Shaking his head back and forth slowly, he said, almost to himself, damn. So yeah, it's about time. It's about time. Marshawn, what do you mean it's about time? I mean it's about time that rich white folks feel what I feel all the time, what we feel, the fear that anything can hit you at any time, that life ain't safe, no time, nowhere, like something's just waiting for you around the corner. It's ugly and it's gonna take you out and make you go from bad to worse. That's what I mean. In the face of an epidemic, it's easy to consider what makes smallpox so virulent, the details about what makes a host vulnerable to HPV infection and associated cancers, the physics around how TB transmission occurs, the mechanisms whereby hepatitis C causes liver failure. Yet behind the individual stories from each of these waves of epidemics that my public hospital has been built and rebuilt to confront, there lies a unifying and much larger public health story the story of how marginalization functions to cause disease. Marginalization, a cousin to and a consequence of racism, is a primary determinant of exposure, vulnerability, and disease. Whether we consider the pathogen M. tuberculosis, the vectors of tobacco or sugar-sweetened beverages, or the transmission of trauma and violence. The extent to which a society marginalizes certain of its members determines who gets exposed, who succumbs, who recovers, who lives, and who dies. That is what the CDC meant when it declared that racism is a public health threat. It's been two years since I had that visit with Marshawn. He still hasn't accepted my repeated offers to provide him with a COVID vaccine. So far, he hasn't gotten COVID. Six months ago, when I tried yet again to convince him to get the vaccine, he just shook his head, telling me how he had just witnessed one of his cousins get shot and killed, and how he hasn't been able to sleep since, how his son had just been expelled from high school because of drug possession, and how worried he was that his son was gonna to have to deal with the police as a result. One month ago, he begrudgingly agreed to blood work to assess his diabetes control. While I was drawing his blood, because he only lets me draw his blood, he told me he was sure that he was gonna lose the temporary sitting house, uh, city housing I had helped him secure as part of the state's COVID-related project room key. The next day, his blood work came back, revealing that at the age of 39, he had developed diabetic kidney disease. 
Marshawn and I have an appointment coming up to discuss what his blood test likely will mean for his health down the line and for his medical care now. I hope he will show, but given prior patterns, there's a good chance he won't. If he does, I know I will have to do some work to convince him to add an ACE inhibitor and an SGLT2 inhibitor, medications that can slow the inevitable progression of his kidney disease, on top of the insulin that I had finally succeeded in getting him to agree to. But now that I understand his story, and knowing how he appreciates that I understand it, we have achieved what I call shared meaning around his life experiences. So I am optimistic he will accept. I also know that we will have to strategize around his unstable housing, but I predict that we will end up spending most of our time talking about the latest murder of a black man at the hands of the state and all the ways hearing about it is impacting Marshawn's life and darkening his vision for his future. Discussing how to delay or avoid a future with kidney failure will somewhat take a back seat to grappling with his past, current, and future experiences with the public health threat of racism. While I know that the effort needed to reach the day when racism is no longer a public health threat will be Herculean, and that this degree of change will take time, that day cannot come too soon. For Marshawn, every day marked by another episode of police brutality or a shooting of a close friend, every day he is at risk of having to live on the street, and every day without taking an ACE inhibitor, together take a serious toll. For Marshawn, whose future health lies in the balance, it's also about time. For the last 30 years, somehow, I have served as a primary care doctor in one of our country's flagship public hospitals, the institutions that disproportionately serve our nation's poor and marginalized. Here, the burden of disease is most concentrated, and our nation's stark health equities are on display. Here, health care meets social reality. My longitudinal relationships with my patients have enabled the discovery of their stories and have shown how these stories uncover the hidden exposures at the root of their illnesses. Over time, such stories have also weaved a larger narrative about public health. When we listen to patient stories and when we subject these stories to scientific inquiry, our understanding shifts. We discover that most illness occurs as a result of an excess of toxic exposures and a deficit of health-promoting resources. This deeper understanding that emerges after hearing story after story, what I call narrative epidemiology, not only can transform healthcare, but also provides a blueprint for dismantling the structural drivers of disease in America. I have shared how eliciting Marchand's story elucidated hidden pathways for me to connect with him so as to harness some of the best of science to improve his quality of life and even extend his life. But can individual stories also hold the key to unlocking the mysteries of human disease and provide answers as to how to reduce suffering on a large scale? In 1854, Dr. John Snow, a doctor working in the midst of an epidemic decimating London, made a scientific discovery that would save tens of thousands of lives in the short term, one with the potential to change the world forever. How many of you know who Dr. Jon Snow was? And I'm not talking about Game of Thrones, Jon Snow. How many, ra raise your hand if you know who Dr. Jon Snow was. How about in the, among the faculty? See, that's why they're faculty. Well, let me tell you story number two. Snow's discovery didn't happen in the way that most people think it did. Few people know the deeper truth behind how he arrived at his discovery and how his method of narrative inquiry enabled him to convince those in power to act on it. This deeper story holds lessons as profound and relevant today as they were two centuries ago. At that time, the growing populations of European cities were plagued by recurrent outbreaks of cholera, a horrific diarrheal disease that spread with brutal pace. Marked dehydration drained the life out of those afflicted within a day or two. In 1854, about 30,000 people, or roughly 1% of London's residents, died of cholera in short order. The popular version of Dr. Snow's transformative discovery is the source of his posthumous reputation as the founder of epidemiology and public health. 
Dr. Snow practiced medicine at a time when microbes had not yet been identified as causes of illness, and deaths due to epidemic disease were believed to be a result of immoral behavior, especially among the poor. But Snow suspected that London's water supply might be the source of the epidemic. To test this theory, the simple story goes, he applied an unprecedented degree of abstract scientific thinking and employed a systematic geocoding method that was entirely novel. First, he obtained the exact addresses of case fatalities from municipal registries. If I could have the first slide. Second, he charted each case onto street maps of London. Third, he overlaid these maps with markings displaying the course of London's underground water pipe system and the positions of their wells and pumps. And finally, focusing in on the hard-hit district of Soho, he was able to discern a visually compelling pattern that pointed to a single communal pump on Broad Street as the likely source of the cholera epidemic. How did Jon Snow come to discover something so insightful and profound? Unbeknownst to many today, Snow was an avid collector of people's stories, namely his patients, and it was these stories that both led him to his discovery and drove his commitment to see it translated into public policy action. Snow elicited four instrumental stories. First, he learned that a subset of Soho's most destitute residents of the St. James Parish Workhouse located just across the street from the Broad Street pump, were somehow spared from cholera. Such Dickensian workhouses, frequently subject to closure by the authorities for poor hygiene and mistreatment of their residents, were unfriendly to unannounced visits from health authorities. This was particularly true of the guardian of St. James, who wanted nothing to do with cholera talk. Snow somehow managed to talk his way in to meet with the man. There he learned that the workhouse had its own private well and a separate pipe supply from a company that drew water from the Thames River at a different location. Second, he noticed that there was not a single cholera death among the 70 workers in the Lion Brewery located right on Broad Street. After sharing, of course, a drink with Mr. Huggins, the proprietor of the brewery, Snow learned that the workers mostly drank malt liquor, not water, and that the brewery had its own well as well. Third, he was surprised to hear that a widow living far from Soho in Hampstead and her niece had succumbed to cholera within days of the Soho outbreak. In discussing their deaths with her family, he confirmed that neither had gone near Broad Street. It looked as though this interview was a dead end as far as his theory went. But having learned from thousands of medical encounters, the truth is rarely uncovered by direct questioning and often is revealed in conversation as an afterthought, what we now call today the doorknob complaint. Dr. Snow patiently gave the family time to muse further. In this way, he discovered that the widow used to live in the affected area, and that while living there, she had developed a special taste for the Broad Street well water and frequently secured a supply of this water in bubbled form. When her niece visited on August 31st, both drank from this same deadly bottle of Broad Street well water. The pieces of his puzzle were beginning to come together. But a central piece was still missing. Believing that something critical must have happened just before August 30th to ignite the epidemic in Soho, Snow learned of Sarah Lewis, the mother of a five-month-old infant who, on August 28th, was the first to come down with diarrhea. She died on September 2nd. After her death, a distraught Mrs. Lewis told Snow that during that interval, her baby Francis passed copious quantities of rice water stools, repeatedly soaking her cloth diapers. The mother revealed that she had rinsed the diapers in cold water and then poured that water into the cesspool located in front of their dwelling. Snow had the final story he needed. The cesspool in front of Mrs. Lewis's building was quickly excavated. It was found to have a leak that dripped its contents into the nearest well, the well that sourced the Broad Street pump. Impelled by this eureka moment and desperate for rapid action, Snow presented the compelling mapping data and associated elegant statistics to the civic authorities. Leaders from the church and the scientific community were unimpressed and fervently argued against his claims. 
As the outcome of the meeting teetered toward failure, Snow wondered whether he should risk his reputation as an objective scientist informed solely by quantitative data and add more personal anecdotal evidence to his statistics. As the meeting drew to its end, Snow requested one last word. He pushed his maps aside and told the real stories behind the epidemic. While the authorities were still not convinced of his overarching theory that cholera was caused by some sort of exposure transmitted via London's unmonitored and poorly designed water system, they were moved enough to take one simple step. They ordered the removal of the handle from the Broad Street pump, temporarily disabling it. Cases of cholera plummeted, and London was changed forever. Nearly 40 years later, Snow's theory was confirmed when German microbiologist Robert Koch detected that the intestines of cholera victims were infected by a waterborne bacterium, which he named, who knows the name? We got something back here. Vibrio cholerae, that's right. Were John Snow alive today, where would he go to find the stories to help him understand the burden of disease in America? collect the data to explain the escalating costs of U.S. health care, and chart the maps that display the underlying structures that unequally distribute disease across our nation, like cholera in London's waterways. In 21st century America, when it comes to understanding health, the invaluable stories are to be found in the public hospital. Public hospitals are much more than just places where poor people who are sick go to receive care. They are where healthcare meets social reality and where a reckoning with our nation's legacy of racism and inequality cannot be avoided. The story of our society and its impact on health is fully exposed on the wards and in the clinics of the public hospital. And while the public hospital is not the place where most Americans get their care, what their patients' telltale hearts reveal here is everyone's story to one degree or another. The stories that emerge from the public hospital should force you and force all of us to ask ourselves difficult questions. Whose stories do we listen to? What do these stories tell us about what causes disease? What do they tell us about unhealthy exposures, about who gets overexposed and why? Whom do we marginalize? Whose lives do we value and whose health do we support? Will we use social investment to promote health, rescue our healthcare system, improve our quality of lives, and save lives. Disease and the suffering that accompanies it is never fair, but some patient stories are so unjust that they serve as a catalyst for broader change, a flash that sheds light on the immorality of the status quo, a spark that ignites a movement to prevent future suffering. So finally, story number three. About 25 years ago, I began caring for a young woman of black and Latinx heritage. She had a gentle way about her, and from the beginning, she was open to discussing her life prior to her diagnoses. A survivor of childhood trauma, Melanie struggled on and off with depression. She also had a lifelong addiction to nicotine and to sugar-sweetened beverages that I will refer to as SSBs. She described how SSBs were a special comfort to her, providing a lift to days that otherwise were weighed down by the blues. She told me that when she was a child, her mother gave her SSBs with every meal and one more at snack time, and that her hands down favorite was Hawaiian punch fruit juicy red. Her mother had always thought she was serving her a real fruit drink. But Hawaiian punch, marketed with particular targeting to black and Latinx consumers, has only 5% fruit juice. The rest is high fructose corn syrup and artificial colors. With four teaspoons of sugar in every eight ounces, she had grown up drinking 16 teaspoons of sugar each day. Over the first 10 years of her life, she had consumed over 235 pounds of liquid sugar, over three times her body weight. As an adult, she had graduated to 7-Up, drinking three 7-Ups a day, translating to 27 teaspoons of sugar a day. Like most Americans at the beginning of the 21st century, she was unaware that this degree of exposure to liquid sugar could lead to diabetes. Unfortunately, she acquired type 2 diabetes in her late 20s. When I first met her, by the time she was 30 years old, she had consumed 2,800 pounds of added sugars solely from SSBs. 
greater than a ton of liquid sugar. In this regard, she was no different from many lower income young adults in the US, especially those from communities of color. Her ailments were in some ways then unsurprising. But to understand why Melanie acquired diabetes requires us to move beyond her individual dietary choices, zooming out to view the context in which she lived. Like the founder of epidemiology, Dr. John Snow, we can begin to understand Melanie's stories by looking at some city maps. Melanie was born and raised in a rental unit in Bayview Hunters Point in San Francisco in zip code 94124, located in the very southeast corner of the city. Bayview has the largest concentration of black residents in the city. It is also home to the city's only power plant and resultant environmental hazards. It also is recognized as the city's only food swamp, devoid of supermarkets but flush with corner liquor stores and fast food joints and lacking adequate safe spaces for recreation and physical activity. My hospital and clinic serve this zip code, its adjacent zip codes, and those of other lower income neighborhoods, mostly populated by people of color. Despite the presence of San Francisco General Hospital and its associated public clinics, rates of hospitalization displayed here for consequences of uncontrolled diabetes, such as acute kidney failure, diabetic coma, and amputation, vary exponentially. In the Marina District, zip code 94123 in the north central part of the city, which is not in the hospital's catchment area and is disproportionately populated by higher income, mostly white individuals with private health insurance, only four to five individuals out of every 10,000 residents were hospitalized for uncontrolled diabetes each year four to five per 10,000. In contrast, in Bayview, between 40 and 70 individuals out of every 10,000 residents were hospitalized for uncontrolled diabetes each year, a 10 to 15 fold disparity. The inverted T shown in that figure reflects the diabetes hotspots of San Francisco, delineating the borders between, no, between those neighborhoods that protect their residents from diabetes from those that promote diabetes. These vast health disparities are a product of differences in social and environmental exposures that individuals and populations experience. In fact, type 2 diabetes is the poster child for how such exposures generate and promote disease. This graph, this map shows how in San Francisco, like most cities in the United States, is socioeconomically segregated and neighborhood environments vary in parallel. The same inverted pattern is mirrored in the patterns of per capita income across the city's neighborhood. In 2009, the Marina District's annual income averaged well over $100,000, while those in the Bayview averaged about $20,000. Similarly, the patterns of SSB consumption in the next slide, now a known antecedent to type 2 diabetes, reflects the same inverted T with the highest consumers residing within the T and the lowest consumers living outside it. The unhealthy social and environmental exposures occurring in the inverted T did not appear by accident. Rather, they are but one reflection of the legacy of racism in America, including one legalized form of racism, redlining. This map, printed in 1937, was created by the Homeowners Loan Corporation, or Hulk. It shows San Francisco neighborhoods color-coded by four different markers. Hulk maps were created by government surveyors during the 1930s that graded neighborhoods in 239 cities where more, quote-unquote, hazardous neighborhoods were deemed risks to banks. Green represents best, Blue indicates still desirable, yellow is definitely declining, and red represents hazardous. Such maps served as one means to deny people of color entry into higher income, whiter neighborhoods outside the redlined areas, while also preventing them from purchasing a home within the redlined areas, an investment that would have had long-term benefits for the individuals and the community. In fact, a recent study of diabetes-related mortality in King County, Washington, demonstrated that those who live in areas once deemed uh, yellow or red have nearly double the rate of death from diabetes as those who live in areas once deemed blue or green. In other words, the health effects of redlining, a concrete example of marginalization, persist more than 50 years after the practice was outlawed. 
Melanie grew up and lived in the epicenter of the inverted T, in the heart of a low-income and historically redlined neighborhood. Her diabetes was poorly controlled. Despite my best efforts and hers, her disease slowly ravaged her body, leaving her with partial blindness, neuropathy that left her legs with painful tingling and an absence of sensation, and worsening depression due to failing health at the prime of her life. She was soon unable to work. As Melanie hit her 40th birthday, she told me during a routine visit that she had finally succeeded in quitting smoking, which was a huge step towards improving her health. Having diabetes reduces lifespan by about eight years, but the combination of diabetes and tobacco use conspires to cut 20 years off one's life. In these cases, tobacco cessation is priority number one, and I felt heartened by Melanie's achievement. She told me she planned to tackle quitting soda the next year, and at the end of the visit, I truly felt hopeful about her situation. Three weeks after that encouraging visit, I received a call from her partner, Jean, who broke the news to me that Melanie had died. To celebrate her 40th birthday, Jean had treated Melanie to a visit to one of her favorite places, a water slide park in midsummer. But because of the long-term effects of diabetes, Melanie hadn't been able to feel her bare feet, even as they were exposed to the searing, hot stairs of the water slides. Melanie hadn't realized they were in need of attention until after the burns became obvious. Although Jean took her to the hospital right away, the damage was so severe that Melanie ultimately required bilateral below-the-knee amputations. She died a few days later as a result of blood poisoning from ascending gangrene of her legs. It was truly agonizing to hear this story. But what struck me most as I processed the death of this woman whom I had come to know so well was the bigger picture, the complicity of Big Soda and its professional and polished lobbying group, the Ameri American Beverage Association. The ABA shamelessly and knowingly produces, markets, and promotes sugary drinks for massive profit, undermining and obstructing all attempts to prevent suffering and save lives in order to preserve financial returns. Melanie's early preventable and tragic story of death taught me that we as physicians need to extend ourselves beyond the daily clinical battles of fighting disease one patient at a time. That fighting diabetes, like so many other diseases, requires waging a larger war. We must recognize and confront the social and environmental root causes of disease that target marginalized populations with as much passion, skill, and commitment as we bring to our clinical and scientific work. Melanie's story, while dramatic in its contours, was not exceptional in its outcome. Different versions of the diabetic amputation story are being replicated all across America, the scope and scale of these battles being difficult to fathom. At the time of Melanie's death, the United States had been waging a war in, an Iraq, in Iraq and Afghanistan for about a decade. During that time, about 1,500 U.S. soldiers had tragically lost limbs in combat. In that same period, more than one million U.S. residents lost limbs to amputations from type 2 diabetes. Since most of them were people of color, we describe it as a mega disparity. Despite these numbers, we had yet to mobilize for a public health war against type 2 diabetes. Thinking ahead, I committed myself to ensuring that the story of Melanie's death would not be in vain, that I would carry Melanie's story with me across policy settings as I tried to advance this cause, and I would retell her story to others, combining it with scientific data to try to move them to action. Melanie's memory and legacy was with me as I tried to make progress as California's Chief of Diabetes Prevention and Control. Melanie appeared posthumously in federal court as I testified against the American Beverage Association in its lawsuit against the city and county of San Francisco after the city passed the first ordinance requiring warning labels on billboards advertising SSBs. She appeared on stage at spoken word events and online as her story inspired an arts-based, award-winning diabetes prevention national campaign entitled The Bigger Picture. Her legacy was present, present in a San Francisco Chronicle cover story about the proposed sugary beverage tax alongside stories of others of my patients as they themselves described how their own SSB consumption had led to diabetes complications. 
Her presence was with me as I appeared on the steps of City Hall with the mayors of San Francisco and Oakland as they endorsed propositions on municipal SSB taxes. And her story animated a recent study our group carried out that showed that the penny per ounce tax on sugary beverages being levied in a handful of cities across the US has led to an immediate post-tax reduction in gestational diabetes of a whopping 41% relative to untaxed cities. And she is smiling from above as we have shown that for the first time, diabetes incidence is falling in the United States exactly 10 years after SSB consumption has fallen. It is my hope that the stories I share today will convince you that we can promote health equity when we bring together the best that science has to offer with the gift that patient narratives offer positively influencing the culture of medicine and the institutions in which we work. We can only achieve this alchemy by eliciting our patient stories, by truly listening to these stories, by remembering them and by acting on them in affirmative ways. When we aggregate such stories across patients, when we attend to the patterns that comprise what I have called a narrative epidemiology, what often emerges is a largely untold story. This story tells of how marginalization generates unconscionable and consequential inequities, drives healthcare spending, and drains resources from other worthy causes. These are scientifically proven facts, but when animated by a narrative epidemiology, such lessons become clearer, more relevant, and more meaningful. It is also my hope that in your bright and future careers, you purposefully and consistently elicit and attend to your patient stories, breaking down the walls that divide us and opening up more doors to see into and identify with each other's real lives and experiences. And that you should tell these stories to others inside and outside your circles, creating opportunities for more mutual understanding, empathy, and positive change. These narrative acts will help us to feel more connected to each other and in so doing, we will become more generous, more inclusive, and more healing in how we relate to each other as individuals and communities, and in how we craft health and social policy for us all. Congratulations, good luck, and may the force be with you. Thank you.